name. So if you have your Bibles, flip or tap or swipe or whatever you got to do uh, to get yourself over to John 10, and let's think about this idea of life for a second. And I'm not going to steal any thunder because later on there's going to be a message on life. But think about why it is that we so desperately want life. Why is it that from our, uh, as a baby with our first breath gasping for life to someone on their deathbed just trying to hang on to that last breath, why is it life is so important to us? It's not just life, but it's life. It's life life. We want a life that matters, a life with meaning, a life that is somehow fulfilling this world. Why is that? Because we've been wired for it. It's why John is saying, I, I want you to have life, and it only comes through the name of Jesus. And so we land in John 10, and in this account, Jesus tells a little, he paints a little picture for us about this life and where it comes from. John 10, let's start in, in verse 1. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice." A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. I don't know about you, but I am always encouraged by that last verse. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what in the heck he was talking about. It's encouraging to me, but we have to be careful in that encouragement. Because sometimes we hear a statement like that and we go, well, I don't have to understand Scripture. It's ununderstandable. It's not what he's saying. But it is still encouraging. He is saying that we can, he's not saying we couldn't understand it. He's saying that they didn't get the connection there. See, for me, what I don't understand about this is the whole sheep thing. I was born in Detroit and moved to Lansing um, when I was four and I plan to get out of there as soon as humanly possible. I'm 45, have not left. Um, and the only sheep I see are, are about a mile from my house at the edge of Michigan State University, right? And so I know nothing about sheep except for that picture. But the people who are listening to Jesus, they would have got this picture way better than we do. The image they got here is of a shepherd waking up in the morning, and he, he goes downstairs and he he turns up his Keurig or his hipster pour over, whatever, and he makes his coffee, and then he goes to hang out with the sheep for the day. And so the first thing he does is he shows up at the sheep fold, right? And so what that is is this big um, area with like a stone wall in which the sheep have spent their night. And there's only one door into the sheep fold, and it would have been shut and it would have been locked, and there would have been a gatekeeper there. And sometimes the gatekeeper would actually sleep in front of the gate to make sure that nobody gets in there to unlock the door to get to the sheep. And so the only way to get into the sheepfold is through the gatekeeper or over the wall, right? And so then, in the morning, the shepherd would wander over and he'd kick the guy, and he'd wake him up, and he'd say, okay, i got to get in and get my sheep. And the gatekeeper would recognize him, would unlock the door, and the shepherd would go in. And this is where it gets crazy. The shepherd would call out to his sheep. Well, why would he do that? Because it's not just his flock inside there. Inside that, that pen, there may be a couple different shepherd sheep kind of all in there mixed up together. I mean, have you ever walked into a playground with a bunch of little kids, tried to find your kid? You can find your kid, right? You know what your kid looks like, but the sheep, Every sheep looks exactly the same to me. But this shepherd shows up, and he knows his sheep, and he calls out to his sheep, and they know his voice. And they recognize him, so they come to him. Now, I, for many years, called BS on that. And I apologize for that. I don't know how that works down in Detroit. But I, I, because I'm like, how does a sheep actually know the voice of a shepherd? That's, that's crazy. Like, maybe a dog could. Right? But a sheep? And then someone told me this story, and I, I couldn't verify it, but I'll give it to you anyway, and we'll pretend it's true, because it probably came from the internet, so that means it's true. Um, 
But someone told me the story of this guy who had, the, he had his sheep and he sold two little lambs to a guy who had another flock. And so that guy took those lambs and put them in the flock. And one day he's driving in the car and he says, yeah, I sold a couple sheep to this guy. And then as they're going along, he sees the flock out there and he goes, there they are. <laughs> Rolls down his window, yells out, and these two little lambs go, whoop. And look over at him. It's crazy. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. So the shepherd is able to, in the pen, call out to his sheep and to say, hey, it's time for you to go, to go with me. And they all come out and then they follow him out of the pen. So this is the, the story that Jesus is telling. It, this picture of this shepherd leading them out. Now, if a stranger had gone in, a stranger calls out, the shepherd, the sheep run the other direction. But when they hear the voice of the shepherd, they, they, they come to him. So the sheep belong to the shepherd. He is the one who calls them. And Jesus contrasts this with some other folks. He says the shepherd knows his sheep, the shepherd calls his sheep, the shepherd cares for his sheep, the shepherd loves his sheep, but then there's the thief, there's the robber, and there's the stranger. And he said the thief, you know, think about what a thief would do. A thief would sneak over that wall in the middle of the night as quietly as possible, try to grab one sleeping lamb and jump over and get out of there, right? The robber would just kill the gatekeeper, go through, make a bloody mess, leave the doors open, grab whatever he can and get out of there. The stranger would go in and the sheep would not recognize his voice. And, and Jesus is saying there's the shepherd in, in contrast to these. And what is he saying? He's saying the entire context of this story is danger. The context of this story is, is danger, and, and the reason it's dangerous is because sheep are vulnerable. And you know why sheep are vulnerable? Because sheep are stupid. Now, if you don't miss anything else, miss this. Sheep are stupid. If you take a sheep and you put him up against a fence with slats in it, the sheep will see the grass on the other side of the slats, and he will slide his little dainty head into the slats. And then he'll get stuck. But what do you do when you're stuck in a fence? You back out, right? What does a sheep do? He just keeps going forward. He keeps going forward. He sees the grass. He just keeps going forward. Why? His sheep are stupid. When sheep get into a bunch of thorns and thistles, they do the same thing. They get stuck in the thorns and thistles going this way, and they don't back out. They keep going forward. That's why when there's a lost sheep, it's such trouble. Because if it's stuck in brambles, it ain't getting itself out. Because sheep are stupid. They're easy prey. They're easily lost. The entire system is built around the fact that the sheep are stupid and vulnerable. The walls... The gatekeeper, the door, the lock, the whole thing is built around keeping the sheep protected because they are helpless and they are hopeless. I used to think that shepherding was docile until I read, read 1 Samuel. Have <laughs> you read 1 Samuel? David says, yeah, I had to kill lions and bears. As, uh, be, by the way, David, as the shepherd who became a king, that's a thing for another day. But David had to kill lions and bears, and shepherds often have to beat back wolves and leopards. So Jesus tells this whole story, and they're like, we have no idea what you're talking about. And it wasn't that they didn't know the sheep story. They knew all that stuff. Like, we have no connection to what you are saying right now and our lives. So Jesus continues, verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door. <laughs> it's the door of the sheep. Now, I totally thought he was going to say shepherd, but he said door. It's like he jukes us. Like, I'm talking about shepherds, I'm talking about shepherds, I'm talking about sheep. Now, I'm, I'm a door. What is he saying? Well, here's something they would get that we wouldn't get. The shepherd is the door. The shepherd is the guy who's going to let those sheep in and out of that pen. 
outside of a lot of pastures, there would be an, an area, an enclosure that wasn't quite like the sheepfold, but it was another place where the sheep could be protected in case there was a lightning storm, a thunderstorm, something to freak out the sheep. He would go there, and he would be the guy letting them in, letting them in, letting them in, and not letting anybody else in. He physically was the door. So he's continuing this metaphor of being the shepherd by also saying, I am the door. And now the analogy begins to make sense. We're the sheep. We're vulnerable. We're stupid. I mean, I just play this off for a second. We have very real enemies. Satan is an enemy, um, um, and death is an enemy, the final enemy. And, and one of the ultimate enemies is our own sinful flesh. Right? Now think about this for a second. Have you ever told a little white lie because you thought it would just grease the skids of the conversation, make it a little bit easier? Get you out of this conversation. You're like, okay, if I just tell this one little lie, then I can tap out of this whole thing and then I can move on, right? It'll make the other people feel better. Our relationship will be good. So you just kind of make an excuse for telling a little white lie. And then the person asks you for details. So what do you do? Let me explain it. Your head is stuck in the fence. And there's a way out. All you got to do is back up. I'm sorry, I totally lied. Totally, that was, that was a little like, I'm sorry. I was trying to defend myself, make this conversation easier. But we don't do that. That's the easy way. What do we do? We double down on the lie. We press in. We're like, I if I give, I just give, not, and then we have to start remembering details. That's the problem with lying, especially if you're a good liar, is you become just a masterful, painting this beautiful picture of a lie as you're trying to push yourself through that fence, but then later on you've got to remember all those details. Push, push, push. Have you ever been in a relationship you knew you shouldn't be in? You knew it was sinful? What do you do? get out of it? No, you're like, I can make this work. I can make this work. Why do we do it? Because we're stupid. It's our sinful flesh. I mean, this relationship idea, right? It's just so, so it, it, it would be easy to step out. It's painful in the moment, but it's easy to step out. But we don't. We just maroon five the thing. And, and but, Google that. Uh, but anyway, don't Google that. Don't Google One More Night by Maroon 5. I'm not, yes, Google that. That's what we do in those relationships. So Jesus says, I am the door. The door to what? He says the door to salvation. Well, that's a churchy weird word. But listen to Jesus' description of door, of, of this salvation. What does he say? He says it's a pasture, it's nourishment, it's rest. He says it is life. It is life abundantly. You know why we get our heads stuck right here? We want life. We see on the other side life. In that conversation with that person, we're like, man, if I, if I could just get out of this conversation, I'd have life. I'm in this relationship. I think it's going to give me life. Why do we do this? Because we're searching for life and it dodges us. What do we do? We open door after door after door after door, searching for life that we cannot find. I love what Charles Spurgeon wrote about doors. He said this, he says, you will not go out of this place without seeing a door. You will not get into your own house without seeing a door. And when you're inside, you will not get into your parlor, because we all have parlors, without seeing a door. And when you go up to bed, you must pass through the door. And when you rise tomorrow morning and start to go out to work, you have to open a door, too, probably. And when you reach your work, there's pretty sure to be another door to be entered. Doors meet your gaze almost everywhere. So our Lord Jesus Christ seemed to say to you, I will meet you wherever you are. 
anywhere and everywhere. I will speak with you and plead with you. I will make the door of every room in your house and the door of every cupboard too to preach a little sermon to you as you shall be reminded by it. I am the door. Are you searching for life? Jesus is the door. And he's not door like an inanimate object. He's a door like a loving shepherd standing in that sheepfold, protecting and loving and leading his sheep to life. Verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them, and he flees because he's a hired hand, and he cares nothing for the sheep. You've seen this, whether you know it or not. And all you got to do is go into a small business, some kind of mom-and-pop shop, a restaurant, or a bookstore, or a coffee shop, and you can tell who the hired hand is and who the owner is. There's a place called Lewin Harry's in, in East Lansing, where I live. And um, either Lou or Harry, I don't know which one it is, is this guy who owns this place. And whenever he's in there, he behaves so much differently than everyone else. He's got ownership over everything. He's, he's cleaning up tables. He's picking up stuff that people drop. And one day, I ordered my... It's a Greek restaurant. I don't know how to say the word. Gyro? Hero, I always say it wrong, gyro, uh, gyro. So I ordered my gyro, and I was waiting for a long time, and then Lou, or Harry, came up to me and said, hey, you've been standing here for a long time, what's your name? And I said, my name's Noel. And he went and he, he found that my ticket had fallen behind the condiment station, and if he had not been there, I never would have gotten my gyro. And so he gave me baklava, and he gave me a salad, and he took care of my meal, and a, 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 a owner behaves differently than a hired hand. A hired hand, an employee, is there to get a paycheck. And Jesus is painting this picture here. He says, listen, as the good shepherd, I love you and I care for my sheep, and the hired hand is just there for self-preservation. Now check out the contrast, starting in verse 14. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the sheep, and I lay myself down for the sheep. And what Jesus just did is he gave us the gospel in a nutshell. He says, I know my own. We all have this need to be known. And if you read just the gospel of John alone, you know that Jesus is a guy who knows people. From the time he saw one of his disciples and said, hey, I saw you under a tree. To showing up in Sychar and saying to the Samaritan woman there, I know everything you've ever done. He knows you. Well, we don't like to be known. But Jesus knows you. He knows every bit of you. He has seen your sin. He has seen your shame. He knows you. He knows your victories. He knows your failures. He knows the insecurities that you hide behind your bravado. And he hears when you have a scared little voice and you cry out in pain, he knows you and he knows your sin. He's watching you. Trying to press yourself through the fence. Trying to press yourself through the brambles. And he says this, I know my own and my own know me. I'm going to go um, date myself here. Anybody remember the old Bugs Bunny cartoons? Remember Sam, the sheepdog? He had the long hair over his eyes. He always had to do that. He looked like, I mean, it was like way before it's time because it's like hipsters. Um, but, or just like the early Justin Bieber, I guess. So, but um, Sam the sheepdog would always sit kind of in the Bugs Bunny cartoons at the top of a hill and the rest of the sheep would be down underneath. And it, it's a good spot for that sheepdog, for that shepherd to be because he could see all of his flock and he could protect the flock from the wolves. But it has another added advantage. The sheep can look up. And they can see the shepherd. And they can know that they're safe. I know my own, and my own know me. I lay down my life for the sheep. You know what happens when wolves show up? 
sheep and the hired hands run away. But the good shepherd runs at the wall. You know what happened when thieves and robbers come running at the sheep? The good shepherd runs at the thieves and robbers and stands in the way and says, you're going to have to go through me. And what his hearers didn't understand at the time, Jesus' hearers, was that this was going to become literally true. That our enemies, sin, Satan, and death, were going to come bum-rushing at us, and Jesus on the cross would stand in their way and lay down his life for the sheep and become the door. You know, sheep are not just the dumbest of animals. They're one of the most valuable. You know, to that shepherd, every single part of that sheep is valuable. From its wool, to its meat eventually, to every little part of it when it dies. It's the most, one of the most valuable animals. And it's easy when we read stories like this to say, why do you have to do me like that, Jesus? Why you got to say I'm stupid? Why do you have to point out my sin and the fact that I can't seem to break those same old habits that I keep doing over and over and over and over again? Why do you have to do me like that, Jesus? Why are you calling me stupid? He says, I'm calling you valuable. You're valuable to me. That's why I laid down my life for you. Verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. may not seem like a very important verse, but if you're not Jewish, it's pretty important. He's saying that us who are non-Jews, we're welcome to that fold. I'm not going to get into theology of that. We'll do that some other day. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down in my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from the Father. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus does something really weird. He says again and again and again, I'm doing some stuff that someone else told me to do. I'm following the Father's will. I don't do anything that the Father did not tell me. Uh, even the, the famous prayer in the, the, the garden, right? Not my will, but thine be done. I mean, Jesus, Jesus just, he's about to gather. And here he tells us what those marching orders are, exactly what he has been sent to do. He has been sent to lay down his life, not because someone's taken it from him, but to lay down his life for his sheep and to have the authority to take it back up again. Powerfully take it back up again. We have a shepherd who died, and we have a shepherd who lives and we have a shepherd that because he died and because he lives and he rose from the dead and he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, we may have life abundantly. And we may feel helpless and hopeless. And the reason is because we are helpless and hopeless. We are helpless and hopeless. We can't do anything. But we are also loved beyond anything. In your sin and in your failure and in your absolute abject inability to get anything right in your life, Jesus looks at you and he pulls you out of the fence. And you hear his voice and he brings you to safety and he puts you in the fold. And the next day you get out and you walk back over to the fence. And Jesus picks you up and carries you in the fence because you're loved. You have a good shepherd who is the door. You don't have to shepherd yourself. You don't have to save yourself. You are not a door. It's all about Jesus. Let's pray.